All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, great to see everyone. Um, just want to send uh, all of our thoughts and prayers out to the Michigan family. Uh, I talked to Coach Harbaugh this morning. Um, send all of our prayers and thoughts to Mike Hart and his entire family and the Wolverine family and everybody who witnessed and experienced that. Uh, that can be really, really difficult. You know, Mike Hart uh, worked for us and uh, he's a wonderful human being, wonderful coach, wonderful person. And as Coach Harbaugh said, puts things in perspective real quick. So I uh, just want to make sure he knows. I talked to Coach Harbaugh this morning and uh, just to let everybody know that we're, as Gophers, our Gopher family's thinking about theirs. So we'll start with that and open up for questions. PJ, what would you say uh, kind of the characteristics of a Brett Bielema coach team? Well, they're, uh, they do what they do extremely well, incredibly physical. Uh, they're all on the same page. You know, they want to put the ball down and run the football, play action pass, naked, um, you know, just they want to just beat you up. And they've done that to a lot of people this year. They're a really good football team. they got a ton of experience on that team. A lot of guys who played a ton of football, really good athletes. Uh, they do what they do very well. He's done a really good job of coming in and instilling his mentality into that program. I think it shows. Got a lot of respect for him. Uh, you know, obviously he's one of the best co college coaches maybe of all time. And uh, you can start to see that blueprint starting to take shape over there at Illinois. Man, got a lot of respect for what they do and who they are, uh, especially him as a person and as a coach. Looking at it on the bye week through the self scout. Well, uh, I've, I've when you kind of look at the game, um, you know we drop a check down to start the game, right? Uh, we don't get the fourth down, which is on me. Um, we get a tip ball interception. We drop a ball in the end zone for a touchdown, and then that gets picked off. We get a personal foul late. We drop some interceptions. We didn't tackle necessarily particularly well on the last few drives. I can go on and on. Uh, but when it's it was everybody, which then falls on me because um, we, didn't, we didn't execute. You saw the first few games, we executed. We show what we can do on offense, defense, special teams, and again, it doesn't matter the opponent. Um, you know, we've got to handle what we can handle. So going back into the week, we went back to not just the fundamentals and techniques. We did a lot of that, but it was more about executing, right? Showing us why we got in the positions we were in um, last week. And, you know, one thing I always want our football team to know is why. You know, you can coach till your face is blue. If you're not showing why all the time, then it's going one ear and out the other. I mean, uh, from our meeting, team meeting even last night, here's why we talk about this. And then we show them different plays from around the country. And we'll continue to do that. But, um, you know, this team's got incredible resolve. And um, we showed we're not perfect. You know, I think some people think that uh, just because you win your first four games, everything should be perfect. Nobody's perfect. Watch college football. Watch any game in college football. Uh, it's hard. Uh, but these, uh, they, they came back to work right away. I mean, they respond. What I learned about them is a response is exactly what you want to see in the team that we have. Uh, I'm really proud of the response that they had. What did you find out about the issues in the run game outside of losing Mo, which is he's such a difference maker? What did you feel like in the running game against Purdue? Well, I think it was collective. Uh, no pun intended there. Uh, but I think it was collective uh, when you look at it. You know, Mo was a game time decision. You saw him warming up. And, you know, our doctors, you know, and, and him and our trainers got together and just said, we just don't feel good about it this week. And we'll never put Mo in harm's way ever. And none of our players. So we made the decision, you know, not to play him. And um, the other guys, what I saw was it was one or the other. Either we missed a, 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 we missed it, we missed a hole at the burning back position, made a cut too early, maybe didn't trust it enough, or we got beat up front. It was one or the other. And anything that could have went wrong in that game went wrong. But again, that's college football. And really good football teams, what we learned is really good football teams can still find a way to overcome those things. And in past, in past years, maybe we've been able to overcome those. In some years, we haven't been able to. Um, this football team got a chance to see that, you know, you're, you're human. Uh, you're going to keep fighting human nature. But that's the hard part about college football is you've got to find a way to overcome that human nature piece of that. Um, but it was one or the other. And it just seemed like it never went together, Andy. And um, it had one of those days. And, you know, one thing I say, it's not an excuse. It's one of those days. Ah, but who cares? It's one of those days. That's not what I mean. But it seemed as you watch the film, every single thing that maybe could have went wrong did go wrong. And it was one guy out of the 10 or the 11. And it was every play. So we weren't consistent enough as a team, collectively, offense, defense, or special teams. You know, we miss a field goal. Um, it, it felt like we were constantly chasing, constantly chasing. Then when we caught up, there was something else that we made a mistake that, you know, you got to give Purdue a lot of credit. They're a good, really good football team. Um, but that we've always had close games with them. You know it's going to be close, and we just 
you know, weren't able to pull this one out. Do you expect Mo to play this week? I do. Yep. What stands out while watching Illinois' defense? Well, first of all, they're incredibly aggressive. Uh, they've got probably the best front seven. I keep saying that, but we're, that's good. We're playing better front sevens every week. Um, they've got three guys inside the way they play their odd fronts. Uh, they've got three guys that are all 300 pounds. They're all strong. They do a great job of violently, violently disengaging at the point of contact, being in their gap, you know, and then getting, getting you out of the gap so they can go make the play. Probably one of the best defensive lines I've seen at being able to dominate your gap, get rid of the offensive lineman, make the play in the hole. Uh, that, that, that's, that's incredible skill right there. And you can tell it's coached, and they do a really good job of having really good players and then getting them to do what they want to be able to do. Same with the linebackers in the secondary. They're going to challenge you. They're going to get up in your face, play a man coverage. They really make cover one and cover two look exactly the same until the ball snapped, which, again, presents a lot of challenges. They do a really good job at being who they are. Um, you know, they know this, and they don't have a lot of coverages. It's either this or this, but they all look the same until that ball snapped, which present a lot of different challenges. There's a big difference between cover two and cover one, uh, big difference. And they've done a really good job of disguising all of that. Um, and they're well coached, very disciplined team, very aggressive. They all tackle well, uh, very impressed. How much did the bye week help with Mo? Oh, it helped a lot. You know, that, that's one of those things. It's hard. I mean, I think if we had another, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours, uh, he might have made it. And it's something that, you know, you have and then you feel good. And then overnight, you know, then it didn't feel so good. And then we worked through it throughout the week, did a job of limiting him in during practice, uh, but he was out there. And, you know, then you do everything you can to, to get him to, to game day. And I thought he looked really good in warm-ups. You know, he looked good. But uh, unfortunately, you know, we didn't want to, you know, uh, for him, you know, we want to make sure we keep him safe. So unfortunately, he wasn't able to play. But he looks really good this week and, you know, last week. Consistency part for Dalen, what does that what does that look like at this point? I think you just hit it. Consistency, you know. I think consistency for our entire football team, not just one player. I thought we were pretty inconsistent last week for the first time, and I think that's why everybody kind of looked at it. It's like, huh, what, what happened? You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I went out recruiting, and we had people all over wherever I was sitting there going, "Hey, coach, hey, it's been a good start. What happened last week?" Well, it's good when people are saying, "What happened last week?" You know. Um, you know, so we got to keep things in perspective too. Is we're not perfect. Uh, we're not going to play perfect every week, but we got to play better. And every player's got to take responsibility, as all the coaches do too, of being more consistent in what we do and how we do it. And there's always room to be better, uh, no matter what player we're talking about. But consistency is incredibly critical as we keep moving forward throughout the season for every team that wants to win. I think Chase Brown leads the Big Ten in yards after contact. What's going to be the key to slowing down him and that? Yeah, swarm into the ball. Chase Brown, I think, is one of the best backs in the country, period. I think, I think it's well documented. He has been for a long time. He does a really good job. He's got a very similar style with Muhammad, uh, with breaking tackles, getting a lot of yards after contact. He's a very patient runner. Uh, he'll stay behind his offensive line for a while and then pop out the other side. Um, he's incredible. He can finish, too, now. Uh, one thing that separates him from a lot of people is he can break tackles, and then when he gets in the open field, he can end it, too. And I think that's where a lot of his yards have come, too. He's been able to break some tackles, get in the open, and, and finish it for touchdowns. Um, but he's got great vision. Yeah, you know, he's, he's really you know, one of the back, best backs in the country and continues to get better. Coach, is there any particular reason to think that Moe's injury may linger or may be more susceptible to re-injury? Well, not that not, uh, we wouldn't put him out there if that was the case. You know, uh, we would have played him last week, you know, but the bye week was, you know, a great opportunity for him to have a, you know, seven to 10 day, seven to 12 day type injury, um, allow him to have three full weeks of, of recovery. So yeah, that's all you can continue to do is, you know, football's a violent game. People are going to get hurt. You know that. But you as a coach have to do everything you can to, to create an atmosphere of, uh, the ability for players to get healthy, um, you know, and he's played a ton of football. It's not like we need Mo on every single down of every practice. He practices. He hates to not practice. But, uh, you know, we, we, we need to work on getting him to game day. And, uh, you know, and he's done a really good job of that. And, uh, but, no, nothing would uh, – it's, it's football. I can't sit there and promise you that. Uh, it could be something else. Um, it's football. But I know our doctors and our medical staff um, have his health at the forefront of their mind always. And they're always going to protect him the best we possibly can. And, uh, but I don't, I don't see that being something that he's still fighting through uh, the next time he goes on the field. 
From game planning and scouting, what's the biggest challenge from your perspective when you're not sure what quarterback you're going to be facing Saturday? You know, I, I think, but we have, here's the thing, we don't know what quarterback we're going to face, right? Uh, just like last week, we didn't know what quarterback we're going to face. But you have seen the backups in a lot of different games. Uh, when we played Purdue, we, we saw the backup play. Uh, if there's a drastic style of, uh, a drastic, a, a drastic style of quarterback play in, in difference of how they play, then I think you have to scheme. If one's just a runner and the other's a passer, there could be a schematic difference that you have to be ready for both uh, and you have to scheme that part. If they're both pretty, pretty much pocket passers, then it just comes down to, okay, what do they do really well? Uh, but very similar to last week, um, you know, I think 12 was a little bit more of a runner for Purdue, that if he was going to play, maybe we'd have a little bit more quarterback run in. Uh, but then you get down to your second quarterback, you're like, well, how much are they going to actually run him? Same thing with Illinois. Uh, we played against Arder before. Uh, I'm not sure if he's going to play uh, or DeVito's going to play. One of those guys are going to play. Uh, but they have very similar styles. They're going to run their system, and I don't see it changing drastically. Are there going to be little nuances that maybe Art does a little bit differently? Sure. Do they have a week to prepare for that? Absolutely. Then just throw a, a backup in a game. Uh, but we'll be ready for you know, what they do and how they do it and then adjust during the game. You've been one of the least penalized teams in the country since you've been here. What do you think has helped the program excel in that area? Well, I think back to even Andy's question, just consistency, you know, and then, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, penalties are something you can control and then you can't control. There's a lot of plays we turn in, Daniel, okay, and uh, some of those come back as uh, those weren't penalties and some of them come back as they were penalties. And I get all that, but uh, nobody's perfect, right? But what we do is – how you do one thing is how you're going to do everything. So on the field, off the field, the way that we, you know, we hold our players to a really high standard academically. Um, that's just going to be our standard here. Uh, people get to choose if that's what they want. Um, socially, we hold our players to a high standard here. Uh, there's have to and want to, have to match. Living a life of serving and giving, that's got to be something that interests you. Um, and then football, you know, we hold them to a high standard of how they play. Uh, we're a developmental program. So we get guys in here and we, teach them the position and we get them fundamentally sound and teaching them techniques and, and then develop them all through the program. I'm not saying that's the answer uh, because we could have a game where we have a lot of penalties. Um, but our, our players, uh, I want them to have, if you're going to have a penalty, I want it to be a hustle penalty. I want it to be a how penalty. I want it to be aggressive. Uh, but it's the other ones that hurt you. It's the undisciplined ones. It's the ones that are within your control. So we do everything we can to, to create an atmosphere at practice and off the field where we can challenge them and organize chaos to put them in positions where you're going to feel this way during the game and you still have to perform mentally. Because it's truly, I know it's a violent game, but it's more of a mental game than just a physical game because your mind's got to tell your body what to do. So we've got to train them more mentally and emotionally to be really tough. And I don't mean macho tough. We talked about that before with that control and that commitment and that challenge and that confidence and that consistency. Uh, that's tough. And, uh, you know, but every week's its own entity. I mean, you can be a least penalized team for 10 years, and then you can get a lot of penalties coming up. That's just part of the game. A little bit in your control, some of it's outside your control. But you get to control what you can control, and that's what we do everything we possibly can to, to teach that discipline within the program uh, in every area of their life where it's not just football. Joe Rossi's talked, Why don't you more? Go ahead, Andy. Uh, Joe Rossi's talked about not having – kind of a lot of coverages, a lot of calls, just you know, being more streamlined in, in the approach. How do you feel like that helps your guys' defense be successful? Well, I think, you know, I think you watch Illinois. They don't have a ton of calls, and they just play incredibly fast and aggressive. I think you can do that with a team that's played a lot of football. You, know? uh, you can also do a team that's younger. It makes sense in both areas, right? Uh, but for us, we want to make sure we play really fast, aggressive defense because most games are lost. And most games that are won are lost less than the team lost it, right? We want to do everything we can to win football games. And last week, we did not win the football game. We did not win 78%. So we lost the game. Purdue won the game. But internally, there were three things we always say that we need to win if we're to expect to win the game. We didn't win those three things. We didn't win the football game. So you get what you deserve. And we didn't deserve to win it. But when you're talking defensive philosophy – Co even when you look about before Coach Ross even took over, the first thing he did was simplify everything we did, right? And as we've grown within our system, it's simple, but there's little small nuances now that are in it. It might look simple, just like Illinois. It might look simple, it might have two coverages, but there's a lot of little nuances in there that all they got to do is change it one, one little call, and it's completely different. 
So I think we're at that point, and I think it helps our players play really fast. We'll do two more. We'll go Ryan Burns and Mike Grimm. I see you uh, rocking the Dinky Town athletes polo. Why was that important to wear down here today? Supporting our student athletes, doing everything on our part legally that we possibly can, finding creative ways to do it. Um, our student athletes this is what the whole University of Minnesota is all about. Our football program is about the student athletes, period. So anything we can do to support them as we keep moving forward through this new era of college football, we're going to do creatively, legally, and uh, that's what we're going to do. So if it takes me running or wearing a polo to have our fans or donors or boosters or supporters want to help our student athletes because that's not going away. That's the new part of college football. And, um, you know, we need to be able to make people aware of it too. And if we can make, you know, three more people aware of it today, then we're doing, we're doing a positive thing for our student athletes, and we'll keep doing it. Mike uh, Daniel Jackson, uh, now that he's healthy, has emerged. Can you take us kind of through his progress and development as a, as a receiver? Yeah, I, I wish all of you got to see what I see on a daily basis because I think he's made probably leaps and bounds, probably more progress than most players on this team in a very short amount of time. He's had some injuries that have kind of hurt him, you know, here and there that have uh, – taking him back off the field. You've seen a ton of progress. Even at training camp, he was blowing away training camp from the few days he was hurt. But I think you're starting to see what type of player he can become. He's got a lot of years left, um, but he is a really dynamic player. But you talk about a guy who comes out to practice every day. He's got incredible short area burst. He's got great center of gravity. He's strong. He's powerful. Uh, and he's really worked on his game. And he's learned how to work on his game. Uh, I think every like every player, you come here in high, for high school, you're a really good high school player. You come in here and you, um, you probably have never been coached at this level or even practiced at this level, and it's a shock to your system. Uh, and you've got to get used to being coached, and you've got to u- get used to failing, and you've got to u- get used to every day you're going to come in here, and there's going to be something that we coach you on. I think a lot of people think as young players as you come in here and you're like, all right, I did this, I did this, and I did this. Done. I should be good now. Well, you're going to come in tomorrow, and there's going to be this, 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 and this. And then you're going to come in tomorrow, and there's going to be this, 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 and this. That's part of our job as coaches. Um, you know, as Hugh McCutcheon always says, our volleyball coach, we're perpetually disappointed. So every t- no matter how well you did, you're going to come in here and we're going to find something that we can get better at, right, as individuals and as a team. And Daniel's been able to handle that in a very mature way. You've watched him come in here and, you know, uh, take coaching and, and understand it, but also know that here's how you have to truly be able to get better if you want to see massive growth. And uh, I think he's done all those things to get better. Uh, but he's he's going to be one of those players for us in the next, you know, this year, next year, as we keep going in the future, that, you know, becomes a household name because he, he's very, very talented. All right. Thank you, Coach. Appreciate it, everybody. Roll the boat, Sky Mago Gophers.